Paleobotany, also spelled as paleobotany, is the branch of paleontology or paleobiology dealing with the recovery and identification of plant remains from geological contexts, and the use for the biological reconstruction of past environments and both the evolutionary history of plants, with a bearing upon the evolution of life in general. A synonym is paleophytology. Paleobotany includes the study of terrestrial plant fossils, as well as the study of prehistoric marine photoautotrophs, such as photosynthetic algae, seaweeds or kelp. A closely related field is palynology, which is the study of fossilized and extant spores and pollen. Paleobotany is important in the reconstruction of ancient ecological systems and climate, known as paleoecology and paleoclimatology climatology respectively and is fundamental to the study of green plant development and evolution. Paleobotany has also become important to the field of archaeology, primarily for the use of phytoliths in relative dating and in paleoethnobotany. Overview of the paleobotanical record. Macroscopic remains of true vascular plants are first found in the fossil record during the Silurian period of the Paleozoic. Era. Some dispersed, fragmentary fossils of disputed affinity, primarily spores and cuticles, have been found in rocks from the Ordovician period in Oman, and are thought to derive from liverwort to moss-grade fossil plants. An important early land plant fossil locality is the Rhiney Chert, found outside the village of Rhiney in Scotland. The Rhiney Chert is an early Devonian sinter deposit composed primarily of silica. It is exceptional due to its preservation of several different clades of plants, from mosses and lycopods to more unusual, problematic forms. Many fossil animals, including arthropods and arachnids, are also found in the Rhiney chert, and it offers a unique window on the history of early terrestrial life. Plant-derived macrofossils become abundant in the late Devonian and include tree trunks, fronds, and roots. The earliest tree was thought to be Archaeopteris, which bears simple, fern-like leaves spirally arranged on branches atop a conifer-like trunk, though it is now known to be the recently discovered what is a widespread coal swamp deposits across North America and Europe during the Carboniferous period contain a wealth of fossils. Fossils containing arborescent lycopods up to 30 meters tall, abundant seed plants, such as conifers and seed ferns, and countless smaller herbaceous plants. Angiosperms evolved during the Mesozoic, and flowering plant pollen and leaves first appear during the early Cretaceous, approximately 130 million years ago. Plant fossils a plant fossil is any preserved part of a plant that has long since died. Such fossils may be prehistoric impressions that are many millions of years old, or bits of charcoal that are only a few hundred years old. Prehistoric plants are various groups of plants that lived before recorded history. Preservation of plant fossils Plant fossils can be preserved in a variety of ways, each of which can give different types of information about the original parent plant. These modes of preservation are discussed in the general pages on fossils but may be summarized in a paleobotanical context as follows. Adpressions. These are the most commonly found type of plant fossil. They provide good morphological detail, especially of dorsoventral plant parts such as leaves. If the cuticle is preserved, they can also yield fine anatomical detail of the epidermis. Little other detail of cellular anatomy is normally preserved. Petrifactions these provide fine detail of the cell anatomy of the plant tissue. Morphological detail can also be determined by serial sectioning, but this is both time-consuming and difficult. Molds and casts. These only tend to preserve the more robust plant parts such as seeds or woody stems. They can provide information about the three-dimensional form of the plant. 
and in the case of casts of tree stumps can provide evidence of the density of the original vegetation. However, they rarely preserve any fine morphological detail or cell anatomy. A subset of such fossils are pith casts, where the center of a stem is either hollow or has delicate pith. After death, sediment enters and forms a cast of the central cavity of the stem. The best known examples of pith casts are in the Carboniferous Sphenophyta and Chordites. Orthogenic mineralizations. These can provide very fine, three dimensional morphological detail, and have proved especially important in the study of reproductive structures that can be severely distorted in adpressions. However, as they are formed in mineral nodules, such fossils can rarely be of large size. Fusane. Fire normally destroys plant tissue, but sometimes charcoalified remains can preserve fine morphological detail that is lost in other modes of preservation. Some of the best evidence of early flowers has been preserved in fusane. Fusane fossils are delicate and often small, but because of the buoyancy can often drift for long distances and can thus provide evidence of vegetation away from areas of sedimentation. Dot. Fossil taxa plant fossils almost always represent testiculated parts of plants. Even small herbaceous plants are rarely preserved whole. Those few examples of plant fossils that appear to be the remains of whole plants in fact are incomplete as the internal cellular tissue and fine. Micromorphological detail is normally lost during fossilization. Plant remains can be preserved in a variety of ways each revealing different features of the original parent plant. Because of these difficulties, paleobotanists usually assign different taxonomic names to different parts of the plant in different modes of preservation. For instance, in the subarborescent Paleozoic sphenophytes, an impression of a leaf might be assigned to the genus Annularia, a compression of a cone assigned to Paleostichia, and the stem assigned to either Calamites or Arthroxylon depending on whether it is preserved as a cast or a petrifaction. All of these fossils may have originated from the same parent plant but they are each given their own taxonomic name. This approach to naming plant fossils originated with the work of Alexandre Brongniot and has stood the test of time. For many years this approach to naming plant fossils was accepted by paleobotanists but not formalized within the international rules of botanical nomenclature. Eventually, Thomas and Jongmans, Halle and Amp, Gotham proposed a set of formal provisions, the essence of which was introduced into the 1952 International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. These early provisions allowed fossils representing particular parts of plants in a particular state of preservation to be referred to organ genera. In addition, a small subset of organ genera, to be known as form genera, were recognized based on the artificial taxa introduced by Brongniot mainly for foliage fossils. Over the years, the concepts and regulations surrounding organ and form genera became modified within successive codes of nomenclature, reflecting a failure of the paleobotanical community to agree on how this aspect of plant taxonomic nomenclature should work. The use of organ and fossil genera was abandoned with the St. Louis Code, replaced by Morphotaxa. The situation in the Vienna Code of 2005 was that any plant taxon whose type is a fossil, except diatoms, can be described as a morphotaxon, a particular part of a plant preserved in a particular way. Although the name is always fixed to the type specimen, the circumscription is defined by the taxonomist who uses the name. Such a change in circumscription could result in an expansion of the range of plant parts and or preservation states that can be incorporated within 
The taxon, for instance, a fossil genus originally based on compressions of ovules could be used to include the multi-ovulate cupules within which the ovules were originally born. A complication can arise if, in this case, there was an already named fossil genus for these cupules. If paleobotanists were confident that the type of the ovule fossil genus and of the cupule fossil genus could be included in the same genus, then the two names would compete as to being the correct one for the newly amended genus. Morphotaxa were introduced to try to overcome the issue of competing names that represented different plant parts and or preservation states. What would you do if the species name of a pollen organ was predated by the species name of the type of pollen produced by that pollen organ? It was argued that paleobotanists would be unhappy if the pollen organs were named using the taxonomic name whose type specimen is a pollen grain, as pointed out by Cleel and Amp Thomas. However, the risk of the name of a pollen grain supplanting the name of a pollen organ is most unlikely. Paleobotanists would have to be totally confident that the type specimen of the pollen species, which would normally be a dispersed grain, definitely came from the same plant that produced the pollen organ. We know from modern plants that closely related but distinct species can produce virtually indistinguishable pollen. It would seem that morphotax are offer no real advantage to paleobotanists over normal fossil tax and the concept was abandoned with the 2011 Botanical Congress and the 2012 International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants, Fossil Groups of Plants. Some plants have remained remarkably unchanged throughout Earth's geological time scale. Early ferns had developed by the Mississippian conifers by the Pennsylvanian. Some plants of prehistory are the same ones around today and thus living fossils, such as Ginkgo biloba and Cyadopitis verticillata. Other plants have changed radically, or have gone extinct entirely. Examples of prehistoric plants are Aracaria mirabilis, Archaeopteris, Calamites, Dilhofia, Glossopteres, Hymenia protera, Nolumbo aurivalis, Pachypteris, Paleorophy, Peltandra primiva, Protosalvinia, Trochodendron nistae, Notable paleobotanists, Edward W. Berry, Paleoecology and Phytogeography. William Gilbert Chaloner, Isabel Cookson, Early Vascular Plants, Palynology. Diane Edwards, Colonization of Land by Early Terrestrial Floras. Thomas Maxwell Harris, Mesozoic Plants of Jameson Land in Yorkshire. Robert Kidston, Early Land Plants, the Vernian and Carboniferous Floras, and the Use in Stratigraphy. Burbal Sani, Revision of Indian Gondwana Plants. Duncan Field Henry Scott, Analysis of the Structures of Fossil Plants, Constantin van Atting Schaus and Tertiary Floras, Caspar Maria von Sternberg, The Father of Paleobotany, Franz Unger, Pioneer in Plant Physiology, Phytotomy and Soil Science, Jack A. Wolf, Tertiary Paleoclimate of Western North America, Gilbert Arthur Leisman, known for work on Carboniferous Lycophytes of Central North America, 